Hello. Hi, everybody. Good evening. We are doing, I said it's impromptu. Someone roasted me and said impromptu means not planned. Well, in a way, it is <laughs> unplanned because this was actually supposed to happen maybe uh, yeah, a little over a week ago we were supposed to do this and we did a regular live stream instead because the book had not arrived. Here it is in all its glory. It's here. It made it. It arrived maybe a, about a week after it was supposed to, but it's here and that's what matters. And so we're going to talk about it. I'm so glad it showed up. Now, if you know about Marvels from 1994, it's by Kurt Busiek and Alex Ross. And you'll be thinking, it's only four issues. Why is your book so huge? Well, you can actually see the demarcation here where the kind of gray, where the kind of gray like tones end. Then the notes and the other things begin. The entire back half of this is annotations, notes, the pitch. There's a whole giant variant gallery at the back. We're talking variants, like new variants, variants from when this first came out. You just, variants for days. You could just, it's like an art book back here, which is great. And the annotations are absolutely amazing. They, they have, they make, they make it so much better. Let's just say, I love, I can't, I can't go back to a world without annotations. If you are somebody who loves that kind of behind the scenes DVD vibe of just checking, you know, wanting to know any detail, then the 25th anniversary edition, it's a little steep, but I would recommend it because you will get a lot of entertainment out of it. <laughs> You're getting definitely the bang for your buck. So it, it really enhanced some of the things I didn't know or didn't notice, like characters in the background or the inspo pictures. They have pictures of some of the models they used for people. So it was very cool, very rewarding, and it really enhanced reading it again. In this, you get the four main issues. You get issue zero, and then you get the new epilogue that was written in, I think, 2019, which revisits the character of Phil Sheldon and sees what he's up to because the ending of the fourth issue of this is a little bittersweet. So, all right. What is this <laughs> for those who may not know? And I hope Thwazi makes it because I remember he was like, I've finished reading it. So I hope that he makes it. <laughs> but firstly, I have to say that one of the most captivating things about this is the art. The art is absolutely stunning. It's gorgeous. I mean, the story matches, but the two of them pair so beautifully. It just elevates all the experience. Look at Namor. Look at Namor there. Beautiful. <laughs> In all his glory, as he should be. <laughs> it's, I can't get over, every time I read it, I just, I can't get over how absolutely gorgeous it is even just to look at, like, it takes me forever to read this every time because I always just have to stop and be like, oh, that's pretty. Look at all the pretty pictures. <laughs> Namor is nude. Yes, he is. And they mentioned that. <laughs> that's how Namor rolls. He's he's deferring to us <laughs> with, with his little Speedo thing. <laughs> so basically, what this is, is a journey through the Marvel Universe, but not in a, in a encyclopedic or historic kind. Then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. It's more an evolution of the Marvel Universe as told through the eyes of a photographer who lives through it from the golden age all the way through to, I guess, what you would call the, a little bit before the, the modern era. So you go from the timely era heroes and they are quite lovingly recreated all those golden age heroes from back when Marvel was timely before it was Atlas and then finally Marvel. So the treatment of the first human torch is quite nice to see and Namor and Captain America, like the, the big three who kind of made their way down from the golden age to the Marvel Renaissance. I mean, the first human torch definitely does not get a lot of play <laughs> anymore. And this makes him really compelling. Actually, issue zero, where it's all about his perspective and just being trapped under the ground, knowing everything that he's missing is, it's really disturbing in the best of ways. And it really makes you feel for poor synthoid Jim Hammond, first human torch, who some people forget 
even ever existed. They also do some interesting character work with Namor and how people don't know how to take him. So one of the most fascinating things about this series is that you see the history of the universe evolve, but not only do you see it from like a ground level of a civilian who is kind of cataloging it. So you have a different vibe and you're on the outside instead of the inside. So you get to see how it looks for other people. You also see it contextualized through the lens of what Marvel looked like in the nineties. So some of the things they're referred to as people think of them now, especially in like the mutant section where they talk about the rise of the mutants and the, the mutant fear and the, the parallels and the bigotry that comes across a lot better here. It's still not perfect. They don't perfectly encapsulate why they have beef with mutants, but not with the other heroes. But it's way better than in the comics themselves, where it's really the early X-Men comics. They are very much just paying, you know, lip service to it. You'll have issues with, you like the one they reference where um, Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch join the Avengers are like, we got quotes from the X-Men and they say you're a-okay. It's like, but I thought everybody hated them, but that's really a more modern <laughs> development, but you see it happen in this. And so that's very fascinating. There are lots of throwaway lines that are also references to things that fans think. Like there's a party where he has to cover and the Fantastic Four is there and there's a one of some gossipy old ladies and they're talking about Sue and Reed. They're like, oh, what a nice couple. I'm like, but I heard that she's with Namor on the side. And like, oh, the scandal. <laughs> I'm like, that's right. Because that's that's what's up. I'll never forgive that 2018 series, was it? For trying to be like, that never happened. I'm like, <laughs> don't come at me like that. <laughs> don't try and come at me like that. The entire first issue of this, the actual issue one, not issue zero, deals with that golden age. And you get to see, look at the battle between the Human Torch and Namor. There are also little details. Like they try and make the Human Torch's powers consistent with how they were depicted back then, which was he shot fireballs. He didn't have this like steady stream of fire like Johnny Storm has. Just there's lots of loving little details in this. There's also, they contextualize Jameson very well in that he comes up during this era and that he never really trusts these heroes or marvels as our narrator ends up calling them. And so it really contextualizes his later hatred and the way he pursues Spider-Man quite well. So it's just, again, it's a very clever and thoughtful work and it's just it's oozing oozing with love for the marvel universe so if you are a fan of the marvel universe this this is worth it even though of course things in the marvel universe like a lot of them are different now it's still quite a loving time capsule i think it's still you can still place yourself in the marvel universe or maybe even if like you're a more modern fan you like the newer stuff this is this really gives you a feel for like the rich depth of history that there is within it. I also did that thing again where I just stuck a bunch of ripped pieces of paper in it instead of remembering to buy post-its because post-its, what are the <laughs> only really important and useful and you can look professional instead of <laughs> instead of whatever I'm doing. But I took a whole bunch of them. The majority of them I took were in this second part, just because there was, because lots of the things that happened in the second issue, we've actually talked about on this channel, but they make them look super cool. So on this channel, we, uh, we talked about the first Baron Zemo appearance where he attacks them with essentially like Nazi glue and he glues all the people to the street and it's kind of silly, but here they actually do it from the street level. And you see the people and they're like, oh no, I'm stuck and I can't move. But the Avengers will save us. It actually comes across as something that's kind of menacing and that you should take a little seriously and not laugh at the evil glue. I will still laugh at the evil glue. Someone's like, Adhesive X, I will not make it sound cool. <laughs> Does Adhesive X make it sound cool? I mean, Chemical X doesn't make the Powerpuff Girls sound cool, even though they are. They're the best. Who saw that leak of the um, of the script? Oof. <laughs> Big oof. Much pain. Oh, look at that. Look at Giant Man. There's a whole annotation in the back about how 
they drew this because they thought it looked cool, but they acknowledged that they think it's really silly. Basically, when they first saw the um, inspo panel, they're like, how is he not stepping on people? But that's still really awesome. Let's draw. <laughs> which is which is pretty awesome. I love that sentiment of like, yeah, some things are silly, but they're cool though, aren't they? <laughs> it's silly, but cool. Our hero loses an eye in the golden age because the golden age was serious business. And we always need to remember that people losing eyes in their lives, left, right, and center. That's right. Let me, what? See, they're falling out. That's why these are always a bad idea, but I know why I saved this page. So this page has a whole window of wasp inspired fashions, which is so appropriate because the wasp was always changing costumes and was known to be a fashionista. So they include that here by having a bunch of these costumes in the window, almost like she's like a Jackie Kennedy, like inspiring all these fashion changes or something, which I really liked and was also period appropriate if you're keeping it kind of like the Fantastic Four emerge in the sixties type thing. So yes, lots of details. Andre Jones, thank you very much for the super chat. Hi, I'm a comic fan from back when the New Mutants were new and the X-Men had blue and gold teams. I really like your work. Keep it up. Thank you very much. Oh, and the New Mutants were new. Now they're new, new. New, 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 new. <laughs> Many more news. That's why you should never call anything new. Just we need a synonym, but something that will not age out. <laughs> it's still a good name, though. It's still a good name. They also, what they do really well with the mutants is they capture the paranoia very well in the art. Like, look at how they're drawn. They just look really scary and terrifying. It's also matching, like, the the fear and the, the ugliness of everybody's feelings in this scene. But they also look scary. There's just, like, an energy they give off that the story describes that's different than the other heroes. But there's also this thing that Scott says that it hits our carrot like our lead a bit different than it was probably intended if you were reading it from Scott's perspective which is he says Iceman don't forget about it they're not worth it but when he keeps thinking about that our little protagonist here Phil he reads the you're they're not worth it as they're inferior so like it's really it really plays with that concept of the fear of being replaced by mutants, like they're the next phase in uh, in evolution. So it plays with that quite well. And then you have this really humanizing plot where he finds out that his daughters are hiding like a little mutant girl who would essentially be a Morlock because she looks very different from all of these like riots in the streets. And he realizes that mutants are just people and that the fear is essentially unjustified because like a lot of what's going on with our main character is that his view of heroes and Marvels as they call them changes as it goes on and in some ways it actually comes to, you could read it as a parallel for potentially being a, uh, a fan of comics, especially when it gets to the end and post Gwen Stacy, there's a really important Gwen Stacy moment in here that we will get to. El Torito Rique, thank you very much for the super chat. Sup casually, love the channel and love Marvels. Thank you very much and thank you for the sup. I can't ever just, I just be like, sup, <laughs> sup. <laughs> It's so good. You can't just say it casually. You gotta gotta hit it real hard. Let me. Yeah, look at this. Look at this great where he's in the dark room and you you have that red filter again and just the way Cyclops looks. Like I like the idea of Cyclops appearing menacing because like when you when you see their silly yellow costumes and stuff, like a lot of times you're like X Men, but I feel like this really captures that it would be it would be disturbing it would challenge your worldview and i like that that comes through in this mr another thank you very much baron zemo is villain just that sticks around uh i see you that's an adhesive x joke and it's appreciated and welcome here <laughs> the puns are welcome here i'm working on an episode right now where there's puns coming out the wazoo and like some of them, some of them hurt a little bit. They're not my puns, they're the book's puns. I mean, not that my puns don't also hurt sometimes. Ah, yeah, here's the event, the gala, where you see everybody. 
You also have nice things like the the characters talking in like the bullpen or the newspaper office where, again, it's just the observations of the universe, like where they're talking about the press conference they do with the Fantastic Four. And they're like, yeah, look at how the thing looks at Reed. It's like he hates him. And it's just, it's really interesting to imagine what it would actually be like to live in the world where you would be on the outside. Because of course we have the inside track. We have all the info. We've got the scoop. We're in on the soap opera. We're tuning in next week or next month. <laughs> so... <laughs> Emily Sanchez, thank you very much for the super chat. Love your hair. Thank you very much. This is one of my favorite, my favorite units. It was tangled. And I was worried I was going to be able to detangle it, but the detangling happened and it's all good. <laughs> it lives, which is important because I would be so sad if it did not. What they also do in this issue is they juxtapose the rise of mutant paranoia with the wedding of Reed and Sue, which is very interesting because it kind of introduces this 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 kind of parallel paralleling of the world or these different layers of it which you know i like <laughs> el torito rique thank you very much again thank you for saying my name correctly you're welcome and i hope i did so again <laughs> and watch like i butcher it the second time it's like why did you even they have this panel here which i thought you would appreciate of seeing the when it was the four avengers the Hawkeye, Quicksilver, Scarlet Witch, Captain America team, aka the everybody dog pile on Steve team. Everybody, everybody be mean to Steve, the team. <laughs> there we go. What else did I save? I've got to go through to find all my little, of course, I didn't save this, but this is just a great panel of the wedding because this was a really big moment and stuck out like even though Aquaman and Mara get married before Reed and Sue it really does not have the same impact like this feels like it was a, a build up to, to you know like a big moment I love what you can see all the different people the guests at the wedding and look at look at look she put on a dress and look what Reed is wearing that's very Reed this is the, look at Reed can't even be bothered can't even get some fashionable, like, tux wear. Like, Supergirl. Supergirl would have been on brand and had the evening wear going. <laughs> so, you know, if Supergirl can do it, so can Reed. And his unstable molecules, but he just doesn't want to. That's my narrative, and I'm sticking to it. The riot scene is pretty intense as well. And they frame it around also the rise of Sentinels and the rise of Sentinels also recontextualizing how people think about mutants, especially when the Sentinels go rogue. But it is very like, it's intense. And you can tell they've looked at, you know, riot footage and the like to, to get some of the images that they're working with here. And again, isn't everything just amazing? Just, just the art. So good. And of course, look at this, look at this silver. I know I'm just like, look at this, but look, really look at this silver surfle, silver surfle, silver surfle, silver, sur silver surfer panel. I'm trying to combine panel and surfer together and it's not happening, but look at that. Look at how good that is. This is from the third and it deals with kind of this sort of disillusionment with heroes like you have the golden age where people aren't really sure what to make of them they like them but they don't fully trust them and then you have like the the gold like the kind of halcyon like years of wow they're so amazing and they're gonna save us all and you kind of have where people are getting more cynical here they don't they don't quite trust them as much there's more focus on the scandals and what's like what's tony stark doing why is he bankrolling them like who is he like there's lots of questions being asked <laughs> And so that makes this one very, again, it's kind of like the shift of attitudes in the stories being told is kind of being paralleled here, which doesn't surprise me because Kurt Busiek did something very similar in the Astro City series where, but you can do a bit more of that, I find there because he can actually have the, the actual dark age of that specific city. Whereas here you have to work in the confines of the fact that it's already all, you know, pre-existing and you have to work with what really happened inside of there. Oh, this panel's great. Look at this panel where they recreate the coming of the Silver Surfer and Galactus. I will not say Silver Surfer. <laughs> I can't even say how I mispronounced it again. Uh. This one, like there's so much action in this one and there are so many full panels of Galactus. I feel like there is much enjoyment for drawing Galactus and he looks huge 
and amazing and just really, really menacing when sometimes the concept of Galactus, I mean, come on, it's a, it can be a little silly, you know, Galactus, eater of worlds. But the way this is handled is that it looks like the world is going to end. And so inside this issue, you have everybody just thinking that this is it, the world is ending. And you just see how people react with the idea that their heroes can't save them. And he's just like, it's utter chaos, but in a completely different way from the mutant riots of the earlier issue in that there's this feeling of a lack of hope where some people don't even do anything because they feel like it's just not, it's just not worth it. And it's really, really fascinating. It's like a psychological study of what kind of toll these battles would take on the people who have to live through them. Here's another great Galactus. Look at these crouching down over the city, just... Look, look at his helmet. I just had that flash. Remember the female Galactus who exists? I just, I just don't know why, but I just flashed to that. I'm like, what if this was happening? But with Femme Galactus, <laughs> let's think about that for a minute. Because we could. Where's the nullifier panel? Oh, let, we need to get this surfer panel in here though. Battling against the, with the silver surfer. Looks so good. Looks so, so good. Oh, and then you have a beautiful two-page spread of this fight. It's just, it's just absolutely gorgeous. And it, I mean, this battle, of course, happened, but it's nowhere near as beautifully or <laughs> like rendered from you know the '60s edition. And oh, here it is—the panel of Reed giving the nullifier. And this is also really interesting because nobody fully understands what happens. And I like that because the the whole concept of Reed and his secret gadgets that he keeps around will become something that needs to be revisited later on in actual like stories within like the 616 canon. So that's very, the, the ultimate nullifier. It's something that's so silly that it works. It nullifies all the things. You're playing on the playground. I have the ultimate nullifier. Now you can't do anything. <laughs> the quote, the person no one wanted to play with, Reed Richards. <laughs> they also referenced that whole uh, there was like a hoax issue i'm trying to remember what it was but there was like an alternate universe like what if where it was like what if it was a hoax and they they referenced that here with this article of like that didn't even really happen reads a fake <laughs> you know <laughs> which i mean i support all of the the read bashing you know but jameson cannot be trusted we we can't the daily bugle is not a good source for news Nick Barucci, thank you very much for the super chat. Hey, Sasha, just want to send thanks and love from your friends at Dynamite Entertainment. Appreciate you having covered us. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for reaching out. I'm definitely also going to get to the reanimator that you sent me because you know I can't not talk about reanimator because I have a problem. <laughs> I have a problem. It can only be solved by showing reanimator clips. And also that really fun that I picked up when there was a sale on Comixology, the combo of Vampirella and... Oh my God, Army of the Dead, <laughs> which I have to cover because Army of the Dead is one of my dad's favorite movies and he didn't even know that they had comics. So I was like, dad, like you could have been reading all this Ash stuff all these years, your favorite movie that you made me watch over and over and over again for when I was way too young and didn't get it. So <laughs> oh. Thank you very much, Nick. It's very much appreciated. Ooh, here's the, this is the, this is the one where we deal with the dis, like the real, like disillusionment of our main character and the questioning, the questioning of what direction is the universe going in. And we deal with it largely through Spider-Man and through Gwen. And look at that, look at how menacing the Green Goblin actually looks here. It's so amazing. It's so amazing. So at this point, our our hero has written a book about Marvels. He's kind of like worked through his feelings about what their place is in the universe and, but he's not sure where to go from there. And he's starting to feel a bit disillusioned about how people are treating these heroes. He feels they're kind of, he's, he feels like they're ungrateful for the things that they've done. And th but this is also because from his perspective, he's been there from the start. So he has a very different view of it than say the people who are just being born or coming up now, which I feel is also very reflective of being a fan in the comic book industry or you could read it that way. I may just be reading into it, but you know what? That, that's my prerogative. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> that's what analysis is for. So 
And this is really when we're in the height of the Spider-Man is a menace. And this is because people believe at this point that he killed Captain Stacy, that he took him away after the thing fell on him and murdered him. Just all the bad press. The bad press has very much, very much been affecting Spider-Man. It shows that it actually is something that impacts how people on the street level view him. El Torito Rique, thank you very much. The death of Gwen Stacy. Yeah, it was a big story. We've talked about it a few times. We talked about Gwen a fair bit, actually. I find Gwen to be very interesting, especially because of how she's recontextualized and reimagined after her death. Damian Patterson, thank you very much. Love your channel. Which art do you like better, Alex Ross on Marvels or Alex Ross on Kingdom Come? I like them both. I like them both. I feel like there's a lot of passion put into both renditions, but I feel like this story, the pairing of the story and art comes together a bit more here than it does on Kingdom Come. Because if you go through the annotations, there's just so much thought put into absolutely everything. We will get to the, we're gonna, we're going. Get ready, class. We're gonna, we're gonna keep on, keep on keeping on. So what he does is he goes and he, oh, but come on, I can't, you know the um, you know the Power Man panel where he talks to Dr. Doom? That's referenced here. Look, Remember when he goes to get money from Dr. Doom? That doesn't actually happen here, but it's referenced. Check it out. There is Doom. There is Luke Cage. That panel is great. Pay me my money. <laughs> so he starts talking to Gwen because he wants her perspective. And here you see the Gwen that never was. The, the Gwen, we did our retrospective on the Gwen from this time period in the 60s and onward to her death. And she was never like this. She wasn't a very fleshed out character. She was very much in love interest mode after Ditko, where she was in Ditko mode, which was very, very... <laughs> Ditko's characterizations are fascinating. But you see here that she is used as kind of an avatar or symbol of innocence, but she's also given more characterization. She's this optimistic person who loves just loves her life loves living in this universe and you see it here like look at the just the joy and wonder on her face as she sees these things coming over they're actually like invasion things from namor but she's like wow it's amazing <laughs> this this is the best thing to ever happen and she just completely captures like phil's imagination and gives him hope and so you see it again here. Just look at it, like the rapture and just like the holy lighting that's given around her. And so of course, when she dies, it's like the death of innocence. And that was very much a feeling that some people had, you know, with the death of Gwen Stacy, that like, whoa, that that's, it's a moment. It's very much a moment, but it also leads to characterizations like this. Cause again, it really made people think that some people come at it. Like that's not fair. Like Gwen deserve better. And you see that in, you know, a loving view of Gwen like this, but at the same time, it was a very significant event that really made it seem like, okay, all bets are off. Like People can really mess up. And the other thing here is what is also shocking, as shocking as were presented as her death, is the snap. The snap is there. Because we talked about this when we talked about her death. Like the snap was there was a whole like, did he kill her because, or did she, was the shock from the fall? And it was a big deal. And so the fact that this gets such a huge segment in the book, it makes sense, you know, basically. Mark Pippins, thank you very much for the super chat. E. Capone, Ola Sasha from Los Angeles. Greetings from Ontario. <laughs> Greetings from Ontario at night. My window is open, so they can probably hear me outside. I'm like, what is she talking about? Gwen Stacy. <laughs> Nerd. <laughs> Nerd. <laughs> There's also this moment here where he sees that Norman Osborne's death has made the front page and Gwen's is page, Gwen's is page 10, and he just can't even, he can't handle it. And it really... It ultimately, the ending of this is very much that he's very, oh my God, my foot has fallen asleep. That's bad. Oh, I can't even feel it. Okay, let's, that will, that will help. I cannot feel my foot at all. <laughs> We're going to have to, when I leave, I won't stand up because, woo. So, what you see is his daughter now has taken an interest in cataloging all these heroes and the villains and taking pictures of all of them. And you see like, there's the Scarlet Witch and Vision on the cover of Time, but he is losing interest. He's just, he says there's a line here. 
where he just says it just kept going and going and going like which for me at least the way i interpret it it's kind of like but that sometimes you can feel that way as a fan like it's just it's too much to keep up with and i know a lot of people i've talked to who have fallen off because of that there is like it's too much like all the things that i cared about aren't there anymore or they aren't the focus and so you know, I feel like it's almost like a passing of the torch, as it were, fitting for this started with the human torch, but it's almost like a passing of the torch to the next generation of people and just choosing to engage in different things. But I mean, that's like, that's one reading of it in the context of the story um, itself. It just it has to deal with, you know, burnout and him coming to terms with the fact that he wants to live his life. He doesn't want to just focus on these Marvels or, or these other characters. He still wants to be his own person. Actually, Joan Jameson has like a Lex Luthor speech in this. <laughs> where he's all like, no, what? If they are the heroes, then what can we be? Sorry, Marvels. I keep saying heroes. But oh, my God. The foot's coming back awake, and it's horrible. Oh, <laughs> Rusty Shackleford. Thank you very much for the super chat. Venture Bros. <laughs> Speaking of shocking, any thoughts on Ruins? Marvel's god-awful edgelord cloud <laughs> There are some panels of ruins that will stay with me forever. The, who, it's the Hulk, right? Who's mutated, like, does this horrible, like, blob, like, Acura type thing? That Marvels. Marvels is not Marvels, um, ruins. Like, ruins. Ruins is, yeah, it is almost the opposite. It's, it's miserable. But I find it, I find it fascinating, but it doesn't fill me with the same joie de vivre as after reading this, obviously. What we have next is um, maybe new to some, it's the epilogue, which is a new chapter that is added in where you see years later, what's Phil up to? And the nice thing to see for Phil is not only do you get to see a bunch of X-Men, actually the X-Men are in this in a lot of different scenes, like little time that there's the X-Men, there's the X-Men. It's great because there's a scene at the party earlier in issue two where these women, the same women who are gossiping about Sue and Namor, because they're just gossips, are talking about the thing. And they're like, oh, he's hideous, but at least he's not one of those horrible muties. And then you see in the corner of the panel that Professor X, Jean, and Cyclops, they're right there. They're at this party and they are listening to this and having to hear all of this stuff. And it's just a really great subtle moment of, you know, again, showcasing those two worlds on top of each other at this beautiful, you know, prestigious celebration. But then this kind of ugly undercurrent that's happening for some people underneath. Here's this beautiful panel of Christmas tree with some X-Men. You can always tell Cyclops with this nice word. Look, look at Banshee. Look at Banshee use the love Banshee. Yay. <laughs> Nick Fe oh, Nick Fury's there too. I just noticed that. There he is. Check it out. He can be eye patch bros with the protagonist who also has an eye patch. But this is cool because what happens here is there's more hope for the hero because he sees that there's becoming there's starting to be a love and embracing of the x-men and that just kind of fills them with hope and so you get this beautiful lovely storm here check out storm it's you know always tear for for storm need a storm wig or a felicia hardy just a nice white wig <laughs> you gotta gotta get on that because that is a look and i absolutely adore it Mark Pippins, thank you very much. I see Marvels as the first part of a three-part, two-company Alex Ross trilogy. Marvels, Kingdom Come, Earth X. Yeah, I can follow that. Oh, Earth X. They have a, some really nice new editions of Earth X coming out. Um, I was on the fence, but if they're gonna be like like this, well, the extra deets at the end, I might, I might do it. I might be bad, and I might do it. <laughs> then I'll have to share. I'll be like, just for like, come on, this is this thing you all want. <laughs> Dave Myers, thank you very much for the super chat. I have this book buried someplace. Must find it. Just found your channel last week. Welcome. Welcome to the chaos and uh, and the madness. We talk about what we want, when we want, and a lot of things just random. Here's this. Look at this. This is the nice two-plate spread just in, encapsulating all the things that have happened. It just makes the Marvel Universe feel so big and awesome in like the classic sense of like, Oh, not like wow, awesome, or like the slang terminology for it, but just full of of awe. Remember, it just reminds me of that scene of George of the Jungle. Remember that they reacted with awe, awe. And they're like, no, that's A W E. Ooh. <laughs> oh. Then you see here all of the notes. 
look at all the notes. And then you see little things like the inspiration, like here's Namor and here's how we drew him. Here's the first Marvel comic, which was actually like a series that ran before the company was called Marvel and the human torch was on the cover. And so then you kind of recreate that. So you just have all of these notes and they're so detailed. Look, every page just has so much, so much of this was laid out and thought about. And it's so wonderful to see just it, you look at how much you get. Look at all this extra information that you can put in your brain and never need to use again, <laughs> but just know it and feel good about knowing it. Just be like, yeah, these are things that I know. So you get all of these for the first four issues. Then let me tell you what you get. I used one of my daughter's cookie snacks as a um, bookmark. That's the class we have here. We have, look, you have the proposals, the actual proposals that were submitted. I love behind the scenes stuff like this. So you can see what it was going to be and what it actually became, like what they were originally pitching. Look at issue six. There's so much like, there's a pretty like different Spidey thing kind of going on here. And then you have a bunch of art. You have just some of the, look at, there's a lot of Namor happening. You like Namor. <laughs> I actually do really like Namor a lot. <laughs> Namor's cool. Here's a fantastic Doom page. Doom, I was about to say Doom is. Do you see that DC's doing a Halloween thing called Are You Afraid of Dark Side? The pun is so in your face that I have to buy it because I have a problem. I'm like, ha ha, I used to watch that. <laughs> Sold. Oh, you have, look at all the different like Black Widow versions and just, it's so cool to see stuff like this. Just so, so cool. I love it. Oh, look at T'Challa. I'll turn T'Challa on his side as he was meant to be seen. Just, yeah. <laughs> I'm sharing the art with you. I'm just doing like a promo, like buy this because it's cool. <laughs> Hobgoblin looking actually menacing. So after that, you get all of the um, the same, you get the script. Here's the script and all the notes as if you were reading a, reading a play, which is very neat. You also get the same thing for the epilogue. So you get all of the, the pitch for the epilogue, the sketchbook, all of that. And I think one of my... You actually have, oh, I didn't notice this at first. We're doing it live. The articles, you get the articles that they show in the in the paper. I just realized like, oh, I didn't actually finish cleaning up my nails, but that's fine. That's fine because we're casual here. <laughs> you get, the, you can actually read the, uh, the articles, which is so, so neat. That's awesome. I will read them all in my, not, not right now, but in my head, I will read them with my transcontinental Jimmy Olsen accent. <laughs> I love, look at how long this botched Iron Man weapons test is. That just makes the world so much more rich. That's so great. Then the next time you go and read it, you'll know what the article says and it'll just feel like such a more complete tapestry. That's really, that's awesome. And of course, bashing read, the, the only article we need to get rid of all the other. <laughs> Get rid of all the others. Oh, it's so good. An editorial by J. Jonah Jameson. You know you need that in your life. You know you need that in your life. So they have all of those, and there are quite a few of these. And then you have these, like, the character models that some of the drawings were based off of, which is also really, really cool. Interviews with Ross and Busiek. Wow, that's a great cover of, okay, let me calm down and get to the part that I actually blocked off with the page because bookmarks, just like post-its, what are those? They have the entire variant gallery. Like I was saying earlier, Ikapone, thank you very much. Superman is in Marvels. I will, but hold on, I got distracted. Check it out. Woman of the X-Men. With, I love, okay. I really like Punk Storm. I, I think that like some people, is it is it not popular to like 
Punk Storm, I don't know. I like Punk Storm a, a lot. Punk Storm was actually one of the first storms I ever saw. I saw 90 Storm from the cartoon. And then there was one comic that I got from Scholastic. And in it, there was, it was actually the issue where she changed her look to have like the jacket and the mohawk. And I just thought it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Like as a little kid, I was like, this is the best thing. <laughs> I still think it's really, really cool. Like this is the best look of all time. <laughs> So what you have here, you have a bunch of redraws of classic covers, which I always love seeing updated stuff like that. And you have the pinups, all of these great, great pinups. Some of them are done in a movie poster, like a movie poster style, like a, a reel with that nice, nice red. And where are we getting to? Yeah, this is what I want all of the different covers. I used one of them in the uh, in the thumbnail for this, just Spidey taking a picture through a window. Like I said, this part is just like a gorgeous, gorgeous art book. And you have some art by um, different people back here, of course, because they're, they're variants. And again, this is another great Galactus. If you like Galactus and seeing Galactus look really cool, this is the book for you. And also, wow, Silver Surfer looks ripped. Look at his back. <laughs> trying to see which other ones. Oh, I do anything. I do like a good Fantastic Four cover. I do have a hard time imagining Reed taking a selfie, but you know, what's he gonna do? <laughs> oh, and look at that Hulk. Look at that Hulk flying through. You could blow any one of these up and just like have it as a big, beautiful poster or or print. Such love. So much love. <laughs> Ooh, Thor having a soda. Another. A look at this great one of Falcon and Captain America. There's actually a really interesting Falcon moment in here where he's like rejected by his community. There are lots of really interesting like little nods to what was going on at the time. Puncher Joe one, thank you very much for the super chat. I support you, my gal. I support you. Thank you for supporting me as well. <laughs> Reese, thank you very much. Hey, huge fan, a huge storm fan. Where can I get this book? Uh, it depends how you want it. How you want it. You can get it digitally uh, um, off of Comixology. There was a sale. I don't think there's a sale anymore. But um, you can get it physically from a bookstore. Like if you're in the States, it's a uh, Barnes and Noble. You can get it off of Amazon. I got mine um, from Indigo up here in Canada. They were late. Late. So I don't know if I recommend that. But everything is a bit slow up here right now. It might be better now. But yeah, there it's still in print. So there's lots of places to get it. Here, remember that Hawkeye's a ladies man. Here you go. It was a saxophone in this shot, so you know that it's extra sex. I just this one made me laugh because when you know, whenever we talk about Hawkeye and those classic issues that we review, it's always like, oh my gosh, Hawkeye. That was almost entirely how Wasp was gauging if he should join the team. But you saw you saw Jane in the video we did recently about uh, Loki, the first appearance of Loki. Just every all the women be thirsty in the six. There's like, look at these these men <laughs> swoon. <laughs> Russell, thank you very much for the sticker. Thank you for being you. Thank all of you for being you and for being here. I'm so glad because I feel like this was impromptu because it was like we had a date. It was all set and then it didn't happen. So I'm really glad that a bunch of you could could make it. Yes, that's a good point. It's the 25th anniversary. So if you want the specific one, this is for 25 years. So I'm just I'm just imagining like later on, they'll be like, we have even more annotations. <laughs> well, they probably will because they're doing that updated Marvels once. Then they'll add that and I'll have to get that on top of it. But I'm okay with that. Look, there's the Scarlet Witch with some of her original coloration. Like her hair used to be darker back in the day. And she was a bit more magenta or the magenta witch as I called her as a joke. And then people were like, how dare you? <laughs> this was her coloration. Oh, some of these I'm seeing for the first time, as you can probably tell. That issue where they took Gwen to the jungle just so that she could be in the photo so that the article would be one they would print. That's one of the fun things about this. If you have been reading Marvel for a long time or you're getting into it and you're reading all these older issues and back issues and the like, there's so many treats in here for that. Just so many like little details of, ooh, like I recognize that or I read that or like seeing it 
seeing it presented as something like really epic and cool and given a gravitas, even if the original stories were sometimes a little silly and stuff, it's, it's nice, you know? It's nice to see it, it treated as something, something, you know, loved and, and fun. And that brings, uh, that brings joy. <laughs> it sparks joy. <laughs> Here it is. This is the cover that I was looking at that I got distracted, which is this great WandaVision this great WandaVision that, you know, does not present the hot mess that their relationship became, unfortunately. Can we still live there? I want to go back to that. <laughs> mm. Jose Quintana. Thank you very much for the super chat. Great job, Sash. I'm looking forward to my t-shirt. Oh, thank you so much for supporting the merch. People have been beginning to get it. And I'm getting messages and I really appreciate it. I can say that, oh my God. Why do I never adjust this? I'm jiggling it. I can say there were, it's going to be new stuff very, very soon. And I'm very, very excited. It is one of the ones that you all requested and really wanted. And I'm super proud of it. And I can't wait to hype up my uh, my designer, Debashish, again, because he did a great job. And I can't wait to, to show it to all of you. Let me see if there's any others that are just going to blow my mind. I don't need to tell all of you. I do like this. This is a very subtle, understated one, but it's kind of like a what's going on at Xavier's school. I like that. That's that's a nice take on that. I am waiting, biding my time until I can do, I think it's issue four of the X-Men, the one where they turn the blob into a villain. <laughs> oh, I, I do have a drink tonight. I know I normally, like I normally do. It is, it's cherry soda. It's slightly disappointing, which might be why I've left it to the side for so long. Oh, it's so foamy. Don't explode. But <laughs> it is slightly, slightly underwhelming. <laughs> but it's still, it's still a drink and it is hot up here. So I accept it. Oh, there we go. Got through all of it. So yes, this is, this is so worth it. This is so worth it. And it's the kind of thing where I would, I will reread this. I will reread this a lot. I, I read it years ago and I always really liked it, but it was the kind of thing where I was like, oh, I want it, but I'm not sure. And there's so many other things always. But now that I have reread it again, I'm like, how did I, how did I leave this alone? It's, this is something that if I'm ever feeling, you know, like, oh, I'm not in like a Marvel mood or whatever, this is the perfect thing to get back into that. And just how epic and like the world building and just the excitement. It's, it made me, it made me feel really hype about, about Marvel comics. I have to say, I'm like, oh, I'm so ready to go and reread all of like my old, you know, Spideys and X-Men and stuff that I have. The next one I, I have coming for you guys is actually a, a Marvel one. There might be a couple. Cause whenever I get onto that, you know, I get onto tangents. It's, it's not the best. My husband's always like, you need to you need to calm it down. Like I just get excited. I get so excited about Mm. I will. I did read all of the '80s Supergirl run, just just you know recently, and um, I will tell you about it eventually. But my husband's like, you need to calm it down. You need to give gaps, take a break. Don't don't go full Lois Lane on this. And I'm like, listen, <laughs> the people like Lois Lane. Also, it was funny because then in that '80s Supergirl, for the first year, there was a backup Lois Lane story. I was like, she's back. <laughs> it's all coming full circle. <laughs> it's all happening. So of these, I think, I'm trying to figure which was my favorite part. I think it might've been the first. I, I mean, I like all of them. They're all great. But I, I like the first, I think, because yeah, the clay list, don't roast me. The clay list isn't even done yet, by the way. Motorcycle. He's like holding me back. He's like, stop. You need to be stopped. <laughs> I think it's the first one because the timely era and those heroes, they don't have the same... They didn't hit the same way as those early DC heroes ended up having that staying power of Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman. So many of them ended up just being like really iconic. And, you know, it's just Namor and the Human Torch and definitely the Human Torch and Captain America. Captain America, I think, is the one you can make the argument, even though he did have a period where he wasn't published for like 10 years. But they 
they don't have the same kind of thing happen with them. So it was nice to see them showcased in a way that made them, made them feel like they had that kind of weight for this universe. Even though I would argue that when the actual Marvel Renaissance, aside from Captain America, they don't, I mean, I know they bring Namor back in the issue. He's like, let me hit on Sue. <laughs> that made the first thing I need to do, which is also, there are some great what ifs. I love the the what ifs where it's like, what if Sue just married Namor and it's like, then Reed just goes off the deep end and tries to destroy the universe. It's just it's a foregone conclusion. <laughs> but there was one where it's like, he actually like overcomes it. They just got to deal with it. And she has like a, a life with, with Namor. There are a couple, there are a couple like that. Well, actually there are a couple where Sue isn't there. And then Reed goes off the deep end. There's the other one where she dies. Like when they have their, their miscarriage and she ends up, dying and it's just like he again goes off the deep end it was that one presented like she's the only thing stopping him from becoming a full-blown supervillain. i'm just looking at namor fighting <laughs> namor fighting the human torch and this one's interesting too because it shows the toll that the emergence that these heroes have on the protagonist where he's not sure like what's the point of even trying to be the best if you have these people who are just hovering over you potentially there to destroy destroy your life <laughs> yeah this is this is a this is a great time this is this is really i would say that this is a hundred percent worth your time you're just looking at like Ooh. <laughs> and again it's worth it again for like the, i'll show it again just the little details like this you know that show that there is that investment into the Marvel universe and into what the characters have done and what they, you know, what they are doing and where they're going. And somebody said, they're like, can you, you did Supergirl's outfits. Can you do, I think I can sit up again. I think my foot is awake. It is. Huzzah. They're like, can you do the wasps outfits or Kitty Prize? I'm like, listen, the wasps were well, like two hours. <laughs> the wasp, there was a period of time there where I think every issue, sometimes more than once, she would have a different costume. It was a lot. It was a lot of a lot. Graduator 14, thank you very much. Could you cover Sin's past? A classic story. <laughs> An infamous story. <laughs> well, you want those panels? You want the panels of Norman and, and Gwen? Is that what the people want? It wasn't what the people want. I thought we were trying to forget that that was a thing that happened. I thought we were going to do like the opposite of the Omniverse, like a negative verse. We just put things that we don't want to remember anymore. <laughs> it's not getting better. <laughs> it's not getting any better at all. So for those of you who are able to read this, whether you read this edition or just the, the classic issues, what are your thoughts? What do you think? Like DC did something. It wasn't, it wasn't the same thing, but they had a, I actually own it. It's a thing called like legends where it's a, an old man recounting, seeing the, the rise of the DC universe from the start, from the golden age to the, um, at that point, I think it was like just around infinite crisis time was where it ended up leaving off, I think. But it just does not have the, the same weight at, at all as something like this there's some there's a love in this that really translates in just the way that it is presented and just the way that it's written this is like sometimes things have have an, have an aura <laughs> that that it's hard to it's hard to articulate it, but it's it's just there so <laughs> Yes, Legacies. Thank you. That is what it's called. It's called Legacies. And it is right there. That one's by Len. Um, Len. I can never say. I always want to say his name wrong. Ween. It's Ween. It's Len Ween. But I always want to say wine. And my husband roasts me. And he's like, why would you Why would you even try and pronounce it like that? I'm like, look, listen. <laughs> it's like, it's just not the same. It's not. It's next to my Batman Odyssey, which is still a book that I'm just like, I don't know. What happened? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why is Batman Odyssey? <laughs> I can't get over how well this like Galactus fight looks. Is anybody really menaced by Galactus? Like I have to ask. 
just I don't I don't have um I don't have much hope for I think they're doing another fantastic form. Like, listen, I've been hurt before. <laughs> Each time I keep getting hurt worse. I don't want to be hurt again. I was actually so tempted because you know what show for the Fantastic Four isn't actually terrible? That like anime style one from the 2000s. <laughs> so it uh I I don't know. I like I like that show. I'm not gonna pretend. I'm not even gonna pretend that it's not something that I very much enjoyed. That had the episode with um Hot Doom. That was really funny where they take it off. It's like, wow, he's amazing. <laughs> Sue stands. Sue supports. <laughs> it had all the great plots with like um Reed and Doom switching bodies, all your great classic, the need more episodes, just all the things. Show is show is pretty good. It's on uh, Disney Plus right now. So I, when I first got Disney Plus, like for my kids, I was like, "Oh, I'll, I'll rewatch it." And I was like, "I don't hate this. I don't hate it." <laughs> I still can't get over how much of this book is the notes. Like here, it is actually divided <laughs> for you to see. Look at that. It's like a, almost like a. It's more than a fifty split. I think you get slightly more notes than than story. That's so good. Are you here for are you here for that? Do you love behind the scenes kind of details and interviews? And I know some people find them very boring, but I'm like, give me the boredom. <laughs> I'll take the tedium. I'll take info people didn't actually need for a hundred. <laughs> Reese, thank you very much. Fantastic left for death. What is everybody's favorite Fantastic Four movie? I mean, the Corman one that wasn't supposed to be is is a journey. I guess maybe the, I don't know, none of them, none. <laughs> Russell Archer, thank you very much. I found 90s Fantastic Four more accurate. Did you read Annihilation Wave, aka the Gardens of the, gar Gardens, the Gardens of the Galaxy? <laughs> that sounds like a, like a book, a magazine. The Guardians of the Galaxy reboot. <laughs> No, uh, no, I haven't. There's a bunch that I need to catch up on and read a bunch of events that I am behind on. And they're happening. They're always happening. That I saw it just the other day. Actually, this was one of those weeks where, you know, when you don't know what day it is. So Tuesday happened and I thought Tuesday was Monday. And so I started seeing just on my like feed, like some reviews pop up and I was like, what? There's but it's Monday. <laughs> like I kind of I had to reorient. I was like, what? No, it's how is this happening? Jose Quintana, thank you very much. Any plans to attend New York Comic Con? No. <laughs> uh no. Uh with no. <laughs> with how like uh the quarantines and stuff are going up here and everything. That's a that's a no for me, dog. Maybe, maybe next year. I don't know. I'm not a big con person. I've gone a couple of times to the uh Toronto ones. I just find it to be a a lot of people and I, I don't know, I'm, a, I'm, despite how this seems, I'm a very introverted uh, person. <laughs> Rusty Shackleford, thank you again. Not a huge FF fan, Fantastic Four fan, but I will always love the nice cartoon and it's kick-ass theme that they ruined by making it instrumental in season two. It's always so sad when they take the theme and change it. The Batman also changed uh, the theme. And, and I remember being so sad. I was like, but the first one was doing a riff on the 60s theme in the back. Tyler Preston, thank you very much. Thoughts on the ultimate Fantastic Four? I like that it gave us the maker. I really enjoy the maker. And I actually feel that Miles Teller would, was good casting if you're doing a more ultimate Fantastic Four read, but then they didn't go hard enough with that characterization, unfortunately, because I think Miles Teller could have pulled that off. Eugene Dunman, thank you very much. Love your channel. I haven't read this one, but I just got the Marvel Legacy of Jack Kirby and I'm really digging the full page art. I didn't know just how prolific he was. Keep up the great work, Gino. Thank you very much. And Jack Kirby's everywhere. I saw a meme the other day because I was rereading the first appearance of Darkseid, which he um, he introduces him in Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen, because they put him on that when he goes to DC. And he's like, well, I'm introducing my characters <laughs> before he does the, the fourth world and the, the new gods. So you have this one panel at the bottom of that issue, which is the first appearance of Darkseid. It's really more of a, a cameo, but he's colored completely differently. He doesn't have his um his look yet. And he's like, because they were doing a Jack Palance, who's who he was inspired by. And so they haven't gotten like that full gray coloration on his face yet. 
<laughs> and so there was that meme, like, you know, it's like, this doesn't exist. It can't hurt you. And then it's the thing and it can hurt you. And it's like, Caucasian the dark side doesn't exist. You can't hurt you. It's like Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen, <laughs> featuring Caucasian dark side. <laughs> it's so random. I know. I, the memes keep me young. What can I say? <laughs> I keep up with the, the internet culture. It keeps me young or it will for the next few years, however long I can stomach it. Uh, Death's move. Thank you very much for the super chat. I appreciate it. Dark side is, are you afraid of dark side? I'm going to, oh, that book's $10 though. It's $10. The same with heroes reborn. There are a couple that look cute, but they're like four or $5 each. And I'm like, it's not that cute. <laughs> It's not as cute as, you know, like I could get like three of these sodas for that. Three of these lackluster sodas. <laughs> it's just, you know what it is? It's because they're doing a, uh, they're doing a more natural thing, which is great, but it makes it taste slightly medicinal, you know, like cherry flavored medicine. It kind of tastes like that. I feel like I should be healthier after this, except I know I really won't be. Oh, yeah, I definitely won't be. <laughs> Not at all. But since 1969, so vintage, appropriate, because we're talking about Marvel <laughs> and the Marvel Renaissance. I was trying to do, like, some Lady Loki stuff to be topical, and then I was just like, I'm not that person. <laughs> I'm not that person. But I don't, I haven't even, I'm not gonna lie, I haven't even watched it. it. I haven't even watched it yet. I don't know when I'm going to, if I'm going to, it could be months, it could be years. That's how, I, that's how we roll here when we could be reading, what was I reading the other day? Supergirl. I mean, mostly Supergirl. I've read a lot of Supergirl lately because I also read the, uh, the adventure comics stuff as well. So it's just been Kara, Kara, Kara. And even as I said that in my heart, I was like, car, car, car. <laughs> but um, I did read the Fantastic Four um, life story where they're doing the condensing like of everything into one timeline. And I have to say it was, I mean, it wasn't that different from what actually happened in the Fantastic Four. So I don't know. <laughs> That's the move. Thank you very much. What kind of camera is that behind you? It is uh it's a canon it's a dslr that is what it is jose quintana thank you very much again what is your favorite personal signed collectible i don't have anything signed uh i don't uh i don't ask people to to sign things so i don't have anything signed i don't have a big uh i don't know i'm not a big celebrity type uh stan like i appreciate people and i appreciate their work but I i'm not a big fan of pedestaling uh people or being pedestaled it's just like I feel like just people need to be treated with respect and like equals. And I don't know, it's just how I've always been. So I have some collectibles that I very much like, but I don't have anything that's signed, nor have I ever had the compulsion to have anything signed. That's just me personally. Um, but I think my favorite collectible I have is actually one just because of where and how I found it, which was, it was, it was a Harley Quinn. It's broken right now, so I need to glue it back together. But it was a little, like a little Harley Quinn bust with uh, the classic Harley Quinn outfit and her hammer. And but and I found it at a Value Village, which is a thrift store. And it was just somebody had just thrown it into like the the collectibles, and it was only five bucks. They clearly didn't realize that it was worth anything. And I was like, I will love this little Harley, and I did. <laughs> and then my daughter broke it. So I need to, because she also loved it. She was like, this is so cool. And then smack the, the hammer snapped off. So it needs to be, uh, needs to be replaced. I guess one thing I do appreciate, I do appreciate the uh, signed poster that Alexandra Monier sent me down after doing the interview, but that's more of a, a memory of the fact that we did that interview and what a fun uh, conversation and time it was. And it's just really appreciative because it was the first that was the first interview. Yeah, that was the that was the first interview and it was the the start of interviews and I'm really very appreciative for for that. So, I appreciate that very much and it has gone up. It hasn't actually gone up in this room. It's gone up in the place where I get ready so I can look at it and be like, yeah, motivated, get hype, you know. <laughs> mm. Let's see.
I can't stop drinking it. It's just because it's hot up here. <laughs> I should have just bought water. But my husband went to the store and he was like, do you want anything? And this sounded like such a good idea. Now I live in only regrets. <laughs> hmm. Hype is not the newest slang. <laughs> I feel like hype's on its way out. I feel like if I'm using it as a slang term, it's probably on its way out. And I love that I like say so many of these things that when it comes up in a story, I'm like, ew, gross, yuck, make it stop. <laughs> but sometimes it's so out of date. The black cat thing I'm working on, she keeps saying beef. I'm like, please stop saying beef. <laughs> and it was funny that I was uh, I was getting all the info and doing pictures and stuff. And then I realized the author lives on Prince Edward Island. And I was like, I know where that is. <laughs> Prince Edward Island, Canada represents. <laughs> I'm always so excited. There's this stereotype that Canadians are always like super excited when somebody else is from Canada. And I'm like, I hate that that's true. I hate that it's true. <laughs> At least it is for me. I'm always like, Canada. <laughs> Same with Mariko Tamaki. I'm like, yeah, Canada. <laughs> Woo. I pre-ordered I Am Not Starfire, by the way. I can't wait. I want to do uh, like a really, like an actual review on it. Like just not, not roasting it, not hyping it. Like, what is it? I'm so curious. I want to read it. I want to see what it's actually like. I'm not presupposing anything. I also want to read that that one that uh, Daenerys, Amelia Clark is coming out with. <laughs> the one that sounds like it's a satire. I'm like, I'm like, I need to experience this. This sounds like I'm going to be so uncomfortable and I'm ready. I'm ready to potentially not even be a person anymore, but just be, I'll just suck myself inside because of all the cringe. <laughs> I'm ready for that. Can we do that? That'll be an experience. I'll have felt something. <laughs> Ikapo, and thank you very much. It's hot in Canada. Oh yeah, it gets real hot up here. I just, my accent, I could hear it there. Oh yeah, there, bud. <laughs> a boot. It does. It's it's super hot. The summers up here get really um really intense. We've been on a heat warning a couple of times uh this week. Like we got up into like the high 30s, uh early 40s. We're on Celsius up here. So that's intense. <laughs> it's uh it's hot, hot, hot. It's melt hot. It's I'm gonna have to wear my clothes that people are gonna judge me for being a mom and wearing them hot. That's how hot it is. <laughs> It's gonna be crop tops and short shorts and just because it I don't care. I'm hot. So <laughs> people are gonna have to deal with it. But oh, also you're gonna see some new glasses. I um I had to I had to get new ones. These this prescription has been I'm sad though. I love these. I love my Clark Kents, but I couldn't find anything that was uh that was quite the same. But you know, the eyesight, it gets worse. So <laughs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> Rusty Shackleford, thank you very much. Mandy Coriander's dad is totally penguin. It just makes sense. <laughs> we'll see, plot twist. I'm looking forward to uh, to reading it. I've I've read actually a lot of stuff that I've liked from um, Tamaki. Like, I loved her run on Wonder Woman. I was so sad when they pulled her off it. I loved the stuff she was doing with Maxwell Lord and his daughter. And I thought that was really interesting. And I'm so sad that now it's probably not going to be revisited. I'm like, no, please. That was some interesting Maxwell Lord. I always like these random like side characters that people are like, here is the, the big, the main hype. And I'm like, I don't know. Like I'm over here caring about Jimmy Olsen. <laughs> My husband like sat me down like for a Jimmy intervention. He was like, listen, I think you need to stop talking about Jimmy Holmes. I'm like, no, but Jimmy. He was like, listen, I know that you think Jimmy's interesting. <laughs> My poor husband. Desmove, thank you very much for the super chat. Have you already done a bit about the 80s Legion of Superheroes run by Paul Levitz and Keith Geffen? You could do a whole series about Matter Eater Lad and Quantum Queen alone. I haven't actually talked about the Legion at all. At some point, I will, because the Legion is, is interesting. And I feel like it's this big part of history that's just kind of been pushed aside in the modern era where it's kind of like, oh yeah, the Legion, but they, they definitely do not have the same cachet as they had back in the day where I feel like they really had a heyday. And I mean, I guess, you know, we could ease into it with like the costumes of the seventies. Oh, Cosmic Boy. That is, what was that <laughs> in the best way? <laughs> like, just like, I love like when you, when you're just baffled, sometimes it's just a good feeling of like, you just want to, you want to go and be like, what, what led to this? Please tell me, because it seems like it would be a very interesting story, and I would like to know. 
Meow Nian, thank you very much for the super chat. What is your favorite Canadian heritage slash Canadian PSA? <laughs> hmm. I have to I have to think back because I don't have uh, basic cable anymore, so I don't see them as much anymore. What's the one with the woman and she has to take the letter and she's running across the fields taking the letter and then they all of these moments, by the way, they're very Canadian. They then panned like a special coin or something that we're selling at that point. <laughs> but um, ooh, my favorite PSA. Because, okay, if you don't know this about Canada, we are renowned for having like really out there PSAs, like a lot of countries do, but we have what I like to call the bait and switch PSA, where it seems like you're advertising something else. This is my fate. Yeah, that's the Laura Secord one. Thank you very much, Meow Nian. But my favorite PSA is this one. It's all these women and they're at a party and, you know, it's like, it's like a bachelorette, you know, so they're giving gifts and stuff like that. And I know it's a baby shower. And so she picks it up and it's like, oh, it's a little onesie and that's so cute. And then she opens the next one. And she pulls out this chain with a whistle on it. And she's like, what's this? And she's like, it's a rape whistle. And then all of a sudden, it's just all these facts about, like, assault. And it's, our PSAs are always like that. They just blindside you. They're like, oh, were you expecting something completely different? Well, too bad. Now you're thinking about it. <laughs> just, I don't know. I don't know why we do PSAs like that. I don't feel like they're effective. <laughs> Oh, um, I don't think they work. I mean, I remember it, but I don't think that it actually did anything. <laughs> but yeah, I don't see as many of those anymore because I'm living that Netflix and just things I can get on my PS4 life. <laughs> so... <laughs> <sighs> Let's see. Let me catch up with all of you. <laughs> oh, I've got a couple of other things that came through. My Invincible Compendium 2 came and it's on the shelf. My um, Sweet Tooth Compendium came. I, I kind of wanted to put it on the shelf and feature it as the, um, the book I have in the corner. But then I was like, he's kind of staring into your soul. And also because of my camera's autofocus, I'm like, it might focus on his face. Like the combo of people potentially being bit afraid and then that it might focus entirely on sweet tooth's face mean that i probably should not put it there so invincible ended up there for now but he may move because there is there's some other stuff that's on the way the pre-orders and the and the like <laughs> just i like to sometimes vary it up sometimes and i really want to get something to put into the bottom corner whenever i see myself filming and i'm like there's so much floor there like, I have no problem sitting on the floor. I'm very comfortable. But, I mean, there, I feel like there should be something there <laughs> that would just be nice, you know, aesthetically. Aesthetically pleasing for the people. <laughs> there is actually a, a video that I have that's done that I have not posted just because, I don't know, the background bothers me. It's the first, uh, it's when the Elastic, Elastic Man gets invited to join the uh, the Justice League. And that story is hilarious. It involves lots of putty and villains called the Putty Men and creepy Superman hitting on Black Canary. And there's just so many beautiful things. <laughs> so many hilarious things in that. Death's move. Thank you very much for the super chat. Just throwing another five to hear you say Karate Kid. Well, there you go. Karate Kid. <laughs> oh. I'm just trying to think of there as always, like my mind's always a, a million places at once. But I think in terms of actually talking about the book, I feel like that's the most cohesive we have been, the most cohesive, the most coherent, the most on point for the longest time that we've been on one of these book clubs. So I, for one, feel like, you know, applauding, applauding myself slightly because I'm like, yeah, we stayed on topic. We stayed on trend. So good. So beautiful. I'll definitely be going through this later because I did not read these uh, these articles and I I need to because stuff like that, it's, you know, that's some Watchmen stuff where they have all that extra, those extras for, for you to read. And I'm a, I'm a sucker for things like that. <laughs> mm. There we go. Oh, is it an accent thing? I don't you know. I don't know. Some people don't know that I'm from Canada, though. So I don't know if I have like that intense of the accent that you tend to get more closer to the either coasts like Vancouver or Newfoundland. 
Ika Poen, thank you very much. Are you a Libra, Sasha? No, I am not. What do you think I am? Guess. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> Guess. What's my sign? I want to see. Do any of you get it right? I'm curious. I used to be, um, I used to be like low key into that kind of kind of stuff, you know, like, ooh, looking at your matches, like, ooh, who's your match? What's your uh, what's your thing? You know? <laughs> Do you say A a lot? I sometimes say A, and then I'm always like, oh, I said it. <laughs> you know, like when they say the title of a thing, oh, she said it. I do say it sometimes. Oh, I see one person who got it. <laughs> oh, two. Yeah, a couple of people. <laughs> um, this, I'm going to let you some of you filter, filter in, and then I'll tell you because it's not that big of a deal. It's like, well, what a secret. <laughs> Uh, secret energy is like, why won't you tell us the, the canon of the channel? Da, 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 da. It's uh, I am a Gemini. I'm a Gemini. My birthday is actually next week. Um, I'm it. My husband is taking me somewhere. I don't know where. <laughs> it's a surprise. But I do. And so, of course, you have to ask, well, how do I need to dress? There is like mid-level fancy. And I was like, I can do that. I can do mid-level fancy. I think I understand what that means. So, <laughs> so I'm a, I'm excited uh, for that. We haven't been on a, a date because of all the, the lockdowns and the restrictions for quite some time. So I'm very much looking forward to an outside date night. We do date night in, uh, in the house and, you know, just, you know, pick a show, just hang out, that kind of thing. Sit on the porch, like an old couple, you know, fun things. <laughs> oh, mid-level fancy just means a trip to a ball and pit Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> oh, well, I raised you one. There's not even a Chuck E. Cheese near where I live, so that couldn't even happen. <laughs> also, no, because you can't eat inside where I am right now. You got to be outside. It's got to be outdoor on a patio. <laughs> I actually tried to go to a record store today, but the line was too long because the store was so small. And then it got super awkward because the uh, the man came out with a clipboard and he was like, what are you looking for? And I was just like, I'm just here to browse. So I just picked an artist's name off the top of my head. I was like, I'm here for it. <laughs> Just to try and just to try and be like, I have purpose. I have reason for being here. <laughs> I was actually trying to go to the comic book shop, but that was closed. Because remember, I made the vow on the live stream that once things opened, I would go. And I'm like, so I still, I still will, but it's not open. But I did paste myself to the window and uh, look through to see what was there. <laughs> so I didn't. I didn't actually, because I think someone would have called like the bylaw police or something. <laughs> She's plastered up against the glass. <laughs> Get her out of here. Get her out. I'm just looking at this marbles here, and now I really want the Earth X. I really do. <laughs> Isaiah Harris, thank you very much for the super chat. Well, happy early birthday, Sasha. Thank you very much. I'm not a big birthday person. If it weren't for my husband, I wouldn't celebrate it. Like, I would just go for years doing nothing. But he was like, you can't do nothing. Let me take you places. <laughs> so <laughs> so now he, uh, he takes me places. So... Yeah, I think Earth X is happening. I think Earth X is uh is definitely a, a thing that we need to we need to do. I'll, I'll put it on the vote for the for the members when um why can't I stop wiggling this? Why can I not, you know? Why can I not be still? I cannot. <laughs> oh. Earth X and Paradise X. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just reading Catching Up. Yeah, I like doing stuff. I'm just not motivated enough to, to do anything myself. I'm like, I'm equally happy. Like I said, I'm very introverted. I'm equally happy just sitting at home. Like, I could just read Marvels all evening and be like, yep, that was my birthday. But I'm also happy to, like, go out. <laughs> Jose Quintana, thank you very much. Why only trade paperbacks and which new releases intrigue you the past few weeks? Why only trades? It's um, a stability thing. I just feel like I'm going to rip uh, the floppies really easily. And I have kids as well. So that's another thing because they come up here and then they, they touch things. And if they, are, they have a better chance of surviving if they are like this in terms of recent releases that came out, just in terms of trades, they finally collected all the um, Harley Quinn, black, white, and red. So I will probably 
pick that up because that is something I know nobody else cares, but I, um, I've still been reading. I am a Joker person. I'm part of the reason they produce a million Joker comics. So there was a new Joker like puzzle box thing. I think it was only like 12 pages that came out recently, like Matthew Rosenberg. I might check that out, but I haven't yet. And uh, there was a, okay, there was a Gwen Stacy one where essentially it's still the heroes reborn. So she's just Batgirl. So I sat there staring at it. I was like, so Night Gwen. So she's Batgirl. I'm like, uh, but I already read Batgirl. So I don't know. So I just stared at it. I'm like, am I interested in this? I don't know. I genuinely can't tell. <laughs> That's how I've been about all of Heroes Reborn. I'm just like, am I? Do I care? <laughs> uh, do I care? It is my fault. I'm also the reason there's like 80 Batman. Because I'm that person who's like, there's too much Batman. And they release a new Batman. I'm like, wow, look at that Batman. <laughs> no, we have Batman at home. I'm like, but I want more Batman. <laughs> I did see they're doing an Aqualad thing though with Jackson Hyde and I do like Jackson Hyde. So, and I'm, I also like, you know, like I'm a stealth Aquaman fan. So many stories, you know, like the waters rise and they're like, this looks like a job for, and I'm like Aquaman. And then it's always somebody else. <laughs> I'm like, but really it was a job for Aquaman though. Like that was that issue with, uh, with Kara when she had the swimsuit outfit and they were these mer people that had come under like the sea. And I'm like, really, this is a job for Aquaman. But I mean, I guess it's also a job for this bizarre swimsuit costume. So, <laughs> you know, either or whatever, whatever is clever, as they say, or as I think people say, or maybe only people that I know say that. So, <laughs> but yes, so I think I'm actually going to pop off and finish that black cat video so that I can get that to you sooner rather than later. And I want to thank all of you for hanging out. And this has been a lot of fun. We will do it again soon. This actually, let me ask before I go. I feel like this might have been a better time. Was the, was the nighttime better than in the middle of the day? Because I'm not sure. I feel like I feel like more people were able to able to make it. So let me know. I will read that back and I will see all of you again soon, be it in a video, be it in a random stream, be it for the next book club, I'll be around. So <laughs> I will see you all again and thank you very much for hanging out and I always appreciate it. And I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.